Olá. Boa noite a todas e a todos. Tudo certo? Todo mundo me ouve? É uma grande alegria tê-los conosco nesse primeiro dia do 13º Encontro Hannah Arendt, promovido pela Unirio, com apoio da CAPES. Antes da última fala desse primeiro dia de evento, eu gostaria de agradecer o professor Rodrigo Ribeiro pela organização deste evento e por ter me oferecido também a oportunidade de colaborar com a organização. Agradeço o colega Lucas Barreto, com quem compartilho dessa tarefa. Eu também gostaria de agradecer todos e todas que estão aqui nas coxias, trabalhando para que tudo aconteça da melhor forma. A Ana Carolina Turato, Aline Lopes, Érica, Giovana Poser, Luísa, Paulo Marques e Tiago Lazier. Bom, nessa noite nós vamos lançar Por que ele é Hannah Arendt hoje, a tradução desse primeiro trabalho de filosofia de Richard Burson no Brasil. Teremos a honra de ouvir o próprio professor Burson, que já está aqui conosco, e gostaríamos de indicar que a fala dele será em inglês, sem tradução, assim como a nossa mediação e o debate. Então, caso queiram colocar as questões ao professor ao final da fala, por favor nos escrevam no chat, em inglês ou em português. E por questões logísticas e orçamentárias, é, não podemos contar com a tradução simultânea. Mas a boa notícia é que toda essa mesa será legendada ao final do evento. Então, a partir de janeiro, essa conferência de hoje estará em nosso canal no YouTube, com legendas em português. Daqui em diante, então, eu peço licença para falar em inglês e receber o professor Burstein. Dear professor Burstein, welcome to our Hannah Arendt International Meeting. It's a great honor to have you here among us because of your committed and extraordinary work on Hannah Arendt, which has illuminated and inspired many researchers on Arendt's thought here in Brazil, and also because you are one of Arendt's sharpest but also generous critics and proves in why read Arendt now uh, an amazing ability to indicate accurately and tersely how the concepts developed by Arendt in the last century help us to think our challenges today. So we are looking forward to hear you about this stimulating work. Richard Burson has published Why Read Arendt Now in 2018, proving the relevance of Hannah Arendt's thinking 43 years after her death. In this book, he resources important concepts of the author, recovers elements of her life, replaces the controversial debates provoked by her, and presents how they serve us to think about the dark times we're living today. Richard Burson is Verily's Professor of Philosophy in the Philosophy Department at the New School for Social Research, where Erin taught until the last days of her life. Bernstein had a short but intense friendship with her over the last three years of Erin's life. The conversation established between them along this time was constant, careful, committed to the independence of Aaron's thought and trajectory, but without refraining from being critical or disagreeing with her. All these features per permeate this work. Bursting shares with Aaron the desire to understand his own world and the conviction that this understanding implies the need to create new concept concepts and articulations between them in order to embrace new phenomena rather than seeking to fit this phenomena into preconceived patterns of judgment. Both believed that we have to think without banisters, even more so in times of crisis. Dr. Burson is a celebrated scholar of American pragmatism. He writes and teaches across fields, including social and political philosophy, critical theory, and Anglo-American philosophy. He's author of several works on Hannah Arendt, such as the books Hannah Arendt and the Jewish Question and Radical Evil, a Philosophical Interrogation, and papers such as Rethinking the Social and the Political, Hannah Arendt and the Ambiguities, Ambiguities of Theory and Practice. Did Hannah Arendt change her mind from radical evil to the banality, banality of evil? Are Arendt's reflections on evil still relevant? And is evil banal? A misleading question. He has received many honors, including the 1999 New School Distinguished Teachers Award. He holds a PhD from Yale University. Well, today we are going to hear him talking about his most recent work on Han Arendt, which has been translated, if, if I am not wrong, into 14 languages and inspires the theme of our own meeting this year. Why read Arendt now? Please, Professor Burson, feel at home. 
Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm enormously pleased to be asked uh, to talk to this group. For a long time, I've been impressed by the um, number of really outstanding Arendt scholars that have emerged from Brazil. Uh, I was mentioning before we began that quite early, I became aware of the, your great statesman and a rent scholar, you know, uh, Cecile Lafer, um, because I felt an affinity with the way in which he read and interpreted um, Arendt and the way in which I read it. The one big difference between us is that he was a statesman who could put some of the ideas about plurality and freedom in, into practice. And that tradition, it seems to me, have continued. Many of, um, of you, or some of you, have actually come to the new school uh, to uh, work on our rent. So I've been impressed by, because I think more than most other countries, Brazil has produced this outstanding tradition of uh, our rent uh, scholarship. So it's a great pleasure, and I'm pleased that my book has been translated into uh, Portuguese, as was mentioned by Nadia, it's now in more than a dozen languages. And maybe I should begin by telling you how I came to write that book. Um, uh, I have been interested in Arendt since I first met her in 1972. And we did have this friendship for the last few years of her life. But I've, over the years, I have returned over, and I continue to return, discovering new insights, new, new, even themes that I that are there that I haven't really sort of realized their importance over the years. In fact, um, I was listening to a statement by Lefe, and he mentioned that one of the things about a classic thinker is that they can speak to you over and over again that they can, that you see new things, that it's not just reading the same thing, that there are new insights that are relevant. But how I came to write the book, um, I uh, published many of my books with Polity Press. I am a good friend of the editor, John Thompson, and we were meeting shortly after the election of Trump in 2016. And it was a time where Arendt, and we talked about this, that Arendt was all over the social media. There was, you know, references to her in our newspapers, there were references in foreign newspapers. And he said to me, well, we have a new series which is intended to introduce people to thinkers. Why don't you write a book called Why Read on Arendt Now? And that became the title of the book. And the book was intended to be, it's not a serious contribution to scholarship. In fact, there's only one foot in the entire book, but it was intended to be for people who had heard the name or interested uh, in uh, to give a kind of overview of some of the themes in her work um, that I thought was still uh, relevant in our own uh, time. And I have been pleased by the positive response and uh, to the book, and that it really did serve the purpose, that it really helped. It did what I wanted. I wanted it to be a basis so that people would be stimulated to take our work seriously and to read um, hard. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, some themes in the book and some other themes. Um, which uh, you're going to, over the next few days, hear a lot of good papers, I'm sure, on our rent that will go into many of her ideas, ideas that I won't even mention today, in great detail. Um, and I'm just going to use the occasion as really setting the scene for your own discussion. I want to read what is one of my favorite quotations from Honor Arendt. It's something that she uh, 
said and that I believe myself. This is what she wrote. She said, she said, she wrote this uh, in, uh, was, uh, in one of her, her books, she said this, I have always believed that no matter how abstract our theories may sound, or how consistent our arguments may appear, there are incidents and stories behind them, which at least for ourselves, contain in a nutshell, the full meaning of whatever we have to say. Thought itself, to the extent that it is more than a technical, logical operation, which electronic machines can be better equipped to perform the human brain arises out of the actuality of incidents. And incidents of living experience must remain our guidepost by which thinking soars or into the depths in which it is. That is, I think, an eloquent statement, which I think is deeply characteristic of Arendt about relating her ideas and thinking is growing out of experience and returning uh, to experience. And maybe I resonated deeply because I share that same type of view. So in order though, to at least introduce and set a scene for your discussions, I wanna review some of the things I discuss in the book about her experience. Um, which I think uh, shaped a good deal of think, uh, thinking. Um, I th we all know that Arendt was born in 1906 in a family that was basically a Jewish assimilated family um, that was had allegiance to um, social democracy. Arendt says, right, that when she was brought up uh, quite young, the term Jew was not even mentioned in her family. And she was not particularly concerned with Jewish issues, you might say through her adolescence. Indeed in her adolescence, she was much more interested in Christian theology and German poetry than in anything that had to do with uh, Jewish issues. Um, as we all know, that Arendt did go, I mean, she was very precocious, very, and she did go to study in Marburg in 1924 at the age of 18 and 19 with Heidegger. Uh, some of you know that she had an affair with Heidegger. Heidegger was already a married man with two children. She was really uh, a young student. I mean, it was much more of a student I think it's important to realize that this affair took place uh, long before there was any indication of Heidegger's Nazi, uh, uh, Nazi uh, affiliations. Arendt felt though that she had to leave, uh, that the situation was becoming intolerable, that she had to leave Heidelberg and she uh, leave Marburg and she went to write her dissertation um, uh, with Karl Gaspers in uh, Heidelberg. It's only in on St. Augustine's concept of love. It was only really in the 20s, the 1920s, that Arendt be became increasingly aware of what was happening with the rise of the Nazis. This is before not Hitler comes to power, but she was aware of what was happening. Um, and in 1933, um, she was closely associated with Zionists, although I'm not a member of a Zionist organization. A good friend, Kurt Blumenthal, who was head of the Zionist organization in Germany, came and asked her, because she was not an official Zionist, if she would be willing to do pro uh, research for them on anti-Semitic propaganda uh, in the state archives. And she did this. 
she did this um, and she was, in, even though the Nazis are not officially in power, this was still apprehended by the Nazis as horror propaganda. She was apprehended and interrogated for eight days. She never revealed what she was doing. Uh, and uh, sometimes she tells the story with a certain amount of humor, but after eight days, she was released. I tell the story because we know of similar incidents is a theme to the, that I really want to emphasize in these early days, that is her good fortune. Fortuna was a significant concept. She was lucky because we know of many stories of people who were interrogated by the Nazis and then murdered in the basement of the Gestapo cellars. But she was released. And once she was released, she um, made the decision to escape from Germany illegally. She could not legally escape and she did make her way to Prague, Geneva, ultimately to Paris, which had become the place where many German Jewish exiles lived still believing that France might hold out against uh, the rise of uh, uh, the Nazis. Um, and she lived in Paris. Again, in, when she was in Paris, she was again lucky in another respect. As a German emigre, illegal emigre, you were not entitled to work. You didn't have working papers, but a rent managed to found work with various Zionist organizations, including a Youth Aliyah, which was the organization that would send young Jewish Europeans, train them, and send them to Palestine. She even took a group of these adolescents. To Palestine in the 1930s. She also worked for other organizations there. So unlike many others, she was able to find work. In 1940, when the Germans were threatening to attack France, the French company decided that they were going to send all, um, by the way, in France, uh, and she continued her good friendship with Walter Benjamin. And the contrast of the story of Benjamin, which is a story of bad luck, and Lorenz's good luck is really rather striking. It's striking. Uh, <clears throat> so she was sent to an internment camp in Gurs, which is in southern France. She was then separated from the person who was to become her husband, Heinrich Glück, and her mother. He was sent to a different camp. The rule was that if you were over 55, like her mother, you were allowed to still stay in Paris. Um, when the Germans actually marched on France, it was a time of a period of chaos, and Arendt was again lucky. She escaped from Gurus. Um, Gurus has great significance because many of the women who did not escape were ultimately sent to Auschwitz by Adolf Eichmann. Um, now the problem became how to get her out of Europe to the United States. Not an easy task. Again, she was lucky. Uh, there, she managed to get a visa for the husband to go to the uh, United States. But of course, that's not the end of the problem. How, as a German stateless uh, emigrant, how are you going to get out, get the papers to get out of France, cross Spain, and get to Portugal where you get a boat to uh, the United States? Um, like many others, she managed illegally to cross the French border because she could not get legal papers. Indeed, when she was leaving, the French police were in search for her and her husband. Remember that her husband at that time, Heinrich Blucher, had been a member of the German Communist Party. 
Um, and the French were searching for him. Um, in fact, there was an incident where she made a big to-do at the hotel that was staying so that they could escape. Um, and they did. They went to Marseille where they had to pick up their visas and then crossed the French border illegally. He, at that time, it was not so difficult for them to get through Spain and arrived in Portugal um, in, uh, uh, where she could take a boat to, the United, to New York City and arriving in New York City in uh, 1941. I tell the story because I mentioned the idea of chance, of luck, of fortuna, um, was a very important concept for Wren. And if we review her history he, up until this point, I mean, she could have been murdered in the basement of the Gestapo. It could have been that she did not escape from gurus. It would have been as eventually sent to Auschwitz. It could be that she would, like many Jews in France, she would not get a visa. And they were then ultimately put in concentration uh, camps. So at all these stages, we can contrast this with the story of Walter Benjamin, who actually a year before went, went through the same route of crossing the Pyrenees. On the day that they crossed with the group illegally, the border was then closed and the emigres to, were to be sent back to, to France. It was on that night that Walter Benjamin committed, I mean, suicide, a great tragic event. And of time, but that's the story of someone with bad luck versus someone which is good luck. When I went to ride in the United States, in New York, remember, she is now 36. She had never been in an English speaking country. Her first language was German, you might say her second uh, languages were Latin and Greek which she studied and knew very well when she was um, still in Germany. She then went to France where French is a language. So that you might say the fifth language that she begins to learn is English. She actually went to live with a, uh, an American family in New Hampshire to improve her English. And even that story is an interesting story it tells something about her rent because um, the family that she stayed with was a bit of an estranged family. I think they were vegetarians. Um, they did not really have uh, very favorable uh, uh, views about American blacks. But what impressed her is that when the woman of the family was uh, dissatisfied with some type of political event that was taking place in America, she undertook to write to her Congress. And the idea that an individual citizen could write to their political representative struck her right from the very beginning. She was struck by, you might say, the social discrimination, the forms of racism could take place, but the sense that they, they were political citizens and could correctly communicate with Laurent never forgot that lesson. And later when she wrote the book on the American, uh, on the revolution, where she deals with the American revolution, it's this political aspect of America that fascinated and attracted her. Going back to her journey, almost immediately, after she arrives, even though she just had learned English, she began to write in English. I should tell this. Arendt did not really identify herself very much with the Jewish tradition until she was really sort of forced to Germany at that time. She wrote this interesting statement. We always knew it. He had enemies. But really, what disturbed 
Arendt when she left Germany was the complicity of the people who were indifferent out of intellectuals. Indeed, she made a decision, which she, fortunately for us, she did not keep, that she did not want to have anything more to do with intellectuals, and that she was going to France to do practical work. And she did. And she worked with these Jewish and Zionist organizations. Indeed, Arendt primarily wrote about Jewish issues from the time, and Zionist issues, from the time that she fled from Germany, 1933, the, uh, until the 40s. Um, uh, and uh, it's interesting when she reestablished with uh, her relationship with Karl Gospers after the Second World War, which is a story in itself, she wrote to him that I have never abandoned uh, my concern with the Jewish issues and the Jewish problem in the, uh, Zionism. Now, Arendt initially was very sympathetic with the Zionists because she felt that the Zionists, this is in 33, were the one group of Jews who were attempting to do something in, about opposing uh, Hitler. Um, and she strongly identified uh, although it was not a, an official member of the Zionist party with us until the 1940s. And in the 1940s, I think this tells something deep about, about, about Arendt too. That Arendt, um, in a way, uh, became increasingly critical of the Zionist, the World Zionist Organization for this reason. She felt that increasingly the Zionists were not really were ignoring the Arab issue. That here is Palestine, with a majority of people living in it as being Palestinian Arabs and a minority being uh, Jew, uh, Jewish Zionists, and that now the Zionists were beginning to ignore and beginning to have a vision of. Palestine, the entire Palestine, becoming a Jewish state. Arendt strongly opposed the founding of a Jewish state. What she wanted was, she belonged to a small group um, of intellectuals who advocated a Jewish homeland, but not a Jewish state. What does she mean by a Jewish homeland? What she meant is a single country in which Arabs and um, uh, Jews would live in a certain amount of harmony working together. Indeed, Arendt was not a person that actively engaged in politics, but the one time she really did engage in politics is after the UN had proposed partition of Palestine to two countries, she was arguing actually intervene in believing that the uh, UN might listen to those more moderates, like Ha, huh? and um, that really, really wanted a Jewish homeland and Jewish state. And if you read what Arendt wrote in the 40s, it's both insightful and, and disturbing. Insightful because this is what she wrote in the 40s. There will never be peace in the Middle East until Jews and Arabs sit down and negotiate together. That's a paraphrase of a statement she made in the 40s. And in one of the articles, which many people were very critical of, Zionism weakens, she wrote about what would happen in Palestine. I mean, this is still a time when the war of independence is taking place. If the Jews actually won, what does she see? She sees the possibility of a country that become militaristic, that would be mainly concerned with self-defense, that would sacrifice Jewish culture in the name. I mean, it's almost prophetic of what's happened. It's little wonder that uh, in Israel today, that uh, and there are many, it's a small group, but many admirers of Israel, because they, they believe 
that the vision she had of what ought to happen in then Palestine, today Israel, is still a vision today. In fact, I have a very good colleague, Omri Bohm, who's written a terrific book about criticizing Israel and arguing that the idea of a Jewish state and a real democratic country that right, recognizes the real rights of its Palestinian citizens is the only viable solution in the future. Now, whether that's utopian or not, I think there's a deep argument to be made for uh, that idea that in some way that the, a, a Jewish state in which dominant, in which they set the religion, in which they set the laws, in which they set the anything in which Arabs are still second class is an impossible situation. And of course, as we know, this has only been exacerbated by the occupation where um, whatever terms you want to use, I mean, Israel becomes a colonial power versus the, um, its, own, its own policy, the Arabs at the West Bank itself. It's an impossible, explosive situation and nobody can actually predict what's always going to happen. But one thing is clear, that this is an unstable and unfortunate situation. Anyway, let's get back. So Arendt begins writing articles in mainly small Jewish magazines uh, in the uh, early 40s, when she barely has mass in English. And one of the articles that has become a classic is her article on uh, the uh, on we refugees. It's been, and it's become a classic for good reason. She wrote with deep feeling, um, a certain amount of wit and deep understanding uh, <coughs> of the situation at that time of the Jewish uh, refugee, of what it means to lose your home, to lose your language, to lose your ability to be stateless at that time. It's interesting that this article now has been published and republished many things because a rank, not only in that article, but in the uh, sections of the origins of the was deeply sympathetic to the problem of statelessness and refugees. And geez, she wrote, when you read, if you read the section in uh, The Decline of the Nation State in the origins, um, what a wrench saw that nobody else was really seeing at that time, that the problem of refugees would be the problem. This is what she said, I'm paraphrasing. Every major event since the first war has created masses of refugees. Arendt could not predict what's happening today, but we see this phenomenon continuing and growing <coughs> where we now have millions of people living in refugee camps. That's the only home that they have who are going to live and die there. Who are never going to be able to, to, to start a new, new life. This rent could not know that in 2021, this would become a, such a serious problem throughout the world, uh, I think. But she had insight to realize that the issue of statelessness and refugees would be the political problem of her time and continues to be of her time. It's one of the reasons why I think that Arendt is so relevant because she had this insight into what could happen and was happening um, in, uh, and continues to happen in our very time. If there are two things that I would like to stress, and I think that they will probably be themes that will recur in your sessions over the next few days. It is 
the theme of living in dark times. Remember, she wrote a book called Men in Dark Times and the opposition to that of lightness. Now, many people think that when uh, Arendt spoke about the dark times, she was referring exclusively to what happened in Nazi Germany and to the Holocaust. But I would actually like to read what she wrote in, uh, in her book about dark times, because I think you in Brazil and we in the United States might think that this was written yesterday. This is what she said. If it is the function of the public realm to throw light on the affairs of men by providing a space of appearances in which they can show in deed and word for better and for wor or worse who they are and what they can do, then darkness has come when this light is extinguished by credibility gaps and invisible government, by speech that does not disclose what it is, is but sweeps it under the carpet, by exhortations, moral and otherwise, that under the pretext of upholding old truths to grade all truth into meaning as triviality. I think this is a perfect description of what has happened in this country during the Trump administration. And from what I read and know, it seems to me that this is something like this is happening in Brazil, which your present government lies. Credibility gaps, trivialization of truth, Denigration of, of, of it. That's what I saw as darkness. And she had ama amazing insight. I think this is one of the reasons she became so popular in the, in, again after the rise of Trumpism in our kind of country it, into this. And I'll speak a little bit about that in more detail. But this is counted. But something which I want to turn to uh, toward the end of my talk today, and that is light and illumination. And this is what she writes in that same introduction. Uh, yes. I wrote in my book, and I quote that part it's hard to resist the conclusion that we are now living in dark times. I mean, this is true, not just in the United States and Brazil, but throughout the world, it all turns to authoritarianism, the growth of extreme right, right parties. But Arendt claims that even in the darkest of times, we can hope to find some illumination, illumination that comes not so much from theories and concepts, but from the lives and works of individuals. Now, what I want to say in my book, I want to show that Arendt provides such illumination and that she helps us to gain a critical perspective on our current political problems and perplexity. She's an astute critic of the dangerous tendencies in modern life, uh, but she illuminates the potentialities for uh, restoring the dignity of if there was a theme that runs through all of the rent, it is to restore the dignity of politics. And this is why I think that reading and reading, reading uh, today is so uh, important. I've spoken now about her sensitivity to the issue of refugees and statelessness. I remind you that a rent remained stateless for 18 years from the time that she escaped from Germany until she finally became an American city, a citizen in uh, the uh, uh, 50s. I mentioned earlier the kind of popularity or the fact that she was all over the social media uh, after the Trump election. I want to go back and say something else, which I think is important for any understanding of 
When Arendt died in 1975, uh, she was known primarily as a New York intellectual. She was also known because of the Eichmann co uh, controversy in terms of the report uh, there. But particularly in academic communities, she was really taken seriously. She was not, and what's interesting to me, I'll never forget that in the 1970s, I was invited to go to France to participate in what was a very small conference on honor or rent. At that time, there was hardly any interest in France in, in, in a rent as a thinker. Uh, 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 what has happened in the period from the time of her death until the present is the increasing international recognition as Arendt as one of the major political thinkers of our time. That was not a phenomenon that existed during her life. It's something that became evident. I have a few hypotheses about this. I think, you know, Arendt identified herself, and I think that's what, that's what she was, as an independent you know, people sometimes ask, are you on the left, on your right? Are you a liberal and conservative? And what she would sometimes say is, look, friends, uh, people on the left attack me for being too conservative. People on conservative attack me for doing radical. It's what she said next that I think is so impressive. This was at a conference in the 1970s. She says, I do not think that the major issues of our time are going to be answered in those terms. That's what I think was so sad. It's like, so one can read on it and sometimes be outraged because what she seems to be saying seems to be so close to what conservatives say. Or one can be excited by a red because what she seems to be seems to be so radical in terms of her notion. I mean, it's not as if she wanted to join, but when the blinkers, when Marxism began to disintegrate, when liberalism as an ideology began to screw, then it seemed to me that people could see with their own eyes that Arendt was unique, that she was really independent. I mean, a kind of wonderful example, I think, and I'll say a little bit about this, is her, 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 her understanding of public freedom. I emphasize public freedom because for her, public freedom is not Lizzie Fair and it's not doing what you want. It is not what our leaders in our country are constantly tell us is freedom, where the government is just to get off your back. Public freedom for house participation, active, deliberate participation, which men and women talk and deliberate together. Um, I've just been reading a very interesting book, a good book on uh, Isaiah Berman and uh, Hunter Wren. And what struck me once again, in the course of Berlin was a great proponent of uh, negative freedom and really felt that anybody who had a positive view of, of freedom, that's a slippery slope to draw to her. Arendt's conception of public freedom is not only non totalitarian, it's intended to be the antidote to forms of authoritarianism. So here's somebody who is developing a conception that just doesn't fit and traditional and which is new. In fact, this is another theme that I think will come out in your conference that I think is so important for our rent is that um, uh, the, uh, not only her in independence and uh, distinctiveness, but I think another thread that runs to her, which is very important for understand, I think that she felt particularly with the event of totalitarianism, that traditional categories broke down, that we could never, not long, could no longer appeal to them. That the task of a theorist was in some ways to develop, cultivate new categories for trying to understand what's going on in the world. And that is what I think I went, uh, try to do throughout that are thinking about freedom, thinking about the American Revolution, and thinking about statelessness, et cetera. Let me turn to a topic which I think 
is always of interest to people who are interested in the way. And the Eichmann book, uh, the report of the Eichmann trial and the um, controversy that it provoked. Um, many people only know it by the nature of the conscience and by the phrase of the novel. So I want to speak of something about the book and something about what she meant by the banality. Um, uh, I think that Arendt was absolutely right. I mean, when the book, before it appeared, she was being vicious, not only for what she wrote, but she was considered a self-hating Jew, oh, a betrayal, a betrayer. I mean, the, the polemic against Arendt was really vicious. And it was organized. It was as if, for example, in the United States, the whole Jewish community was now being instructed not to read the book and to, what a terrible person Arendt really was, was until a, a private incident, uh, an incident that in the 1990s, I was invited to give a lecture on Eichmann in Jerusalem and somebody in the audience got up and started screaming at me. How can you defend this vicious anti semite So that feeling was very, very strong uh, uh, at the uh, time. I think she's right. I mean, there were many myths about the book. There was the myth that she exonerated uh, Eichmann, that she opposed the idea of a trial in Israel. Ill, that she opposed the death penalty, that she opposed the judgment. All of that is simply false. Okay? This is not the case. That's not to say that there are many things in the book that uh, were very touchy. And I think that many times her rhetoric is, I mean, if you think back when this book was written, written that there were many Holocaust survivors with great sensitivity. He, uh, they didn't want to hear what Arendt had to say. And some of the tone in the book, which is ironical, um, was considered many, many people, some people even objected. How could you publish a serious study of Eichmann during the New Yorker? You know that the book first appeared as five articles in the uh, uh, New Yorker, where you have columns of Arendt, and next to it, you have advertisements for luxury groups. So there are a lot of things that I think did offend people and probably offend people. No less, of course, one of the things that she was viciously attacked on was the Jewish council. It's only a small part of the book, but many people seize on it. I think what you know is that the Nazis in various, uh, in the ghetto, ghettos, appointed Jewish leaders to be, to organize their own people. And I think what we do know is that if they, if there hadn't been that kind of cooperation, frequently forced, then the Nazis would have had to use a whole lot more manpower to deal with the uh, Jews itself. What is it that a, a rent objected? She was not saying that Jews are guilty of being you know, for their own victim. But she felt, and when she later clarified, here's where she drew the line. When Jewish leaders in the ghettos made up lists of at, uh, by Nazi orders to um, uh, of who, we, who we shall live and who shall die, and who shall be dead. That's where she thought there was a red line. And she uh, argued that, look, they could resist, they couldn't fight, but they could have tried to do nothing. Whether it's right or not, her pages are too short in terms of dealing with a very complex phenomenon. Because what we do know is some of the members of the Jewish councils were scoundrels. They really were, they enjoy the power. And others who were asked to do it committed suicide rather than carry out the power support. So what's not there is nuance. Although the phenomenon, I mean, at this time, 
it was only, you might say, scholars who knew about the councils or people who were victimized by them. In fact, there's a very famous scene. If any of you have ever looked at the, you know, the Eichmann trial that was, was recorded, and there's a very famous scene in it with Krutinger, who was the head of the Jewish council in, uh, in Hungary, was defending his position of why they did not inform the Jews of what's happening. And somebody in the audience got up to scream, why didn't you tell us what was going on? I mean, there was this very strong feeling. I don't want to cast the story. I can do that in a discussion, which is also a story that brings out the complex. These issues are complex. They're soft. And I think that one of the faults of a rent sometimes is that she states things in such dramatic words that nuance gets lost. But I want to turn now to the concept of the banality. When people, first of all, you should know something factual. When she originally wrote the five part New Yorker articles, she did not use the title of the banality, a report on the banality, it'd be simply a, be a report on like. And the term banality is only used once in the entire book. It's used when Eichmann is about to be hung and he makes this ridiculous speech about meeting people in an afterlife and so forth, she felt that that just brought out the whole banality of this person. I think that now, this is now a little bit of Bernstein on a red. I think that in turn, when there's crisis and people think about good and evil, then people want to think in simply terms of black and white. And this is the way in which up until the 60s, the story of the Holocaust is being told. There are simply the innocent victims and then the vicious, sadistic um, uh, perpetuators. <laughs> it's the way, I don't know about in Brazil, but it's certainly the way in which Nazis were portrayed in B movies throughout the uh, 50s and 60s. You know, the stomping Nazis who are sadistic, and there was plenty of saints. Okay. But Arendt was challenging this simplistic distinction. I mean, it's, it's something that it cropped up in American discourse when, Ameri when the, we, we made the fatal intervention in the first Iraq war with Bush. There's, there are, it was like the cowboys and Indians. Good cowboys and bad Indians. That's the way Bush spoke. We'll get those guys. They're the evil ones. We're the good ones. Where they spoke about I mean when when I remember when Saddam Hussein was still in Papua, you could not look at TV without seeing him as a vicious, vicious person. And naturally, uh, the Americans were the good guys. I think one of the points that Arendt really wanted to make. I mean, first of all, what did the banality of evil? It was not a comment on the Holocaust was not a comment on the deeds, but she wanted to make the point, which I think is now more generally accepted, that ordinary people, if we go into the history of Eichmann, Eichmann without the Nazis would have been a successful or unsuccessful middle man manager. But that ordinary people thrown into situations could do monstrous type of things. And that's what we have to face. That Evil is not done just by sadists, not by vicious people, uh, but that, um, and in fact, she stresses that, uh, uh, that Eichmann um, was, I mean, this is the way she put it, the deeds were monstrous, but the man was not a monster. For many people at that time, that's impossible. If the deeds are monstrous, the man must be a monster. He must be vicious. He must be the way Nazis are portrayed. And she was saying, you really want to understand totalitarianism in the modern world and after, uh, after that, you can't use that category. She said, she actually wrote at one point, most evil in the world is tended, done by people who are not intended to evil. Now, there are two issues that arise. There's a historical issue. 
did Arendt really have the right portrait of Eichmann? I mean, she made him out to be much more less ideological, much less of an anti-Semite than many people thought he was. Um, since she wrote her thing, we now have a lot of historical evidence, including a wonderful book about Eichmann before Jerusalem. And it becomes clear, at least to me, that I think that she overstated her case, that Eichmann was more ideological. In fact, she actually cites what I think is a major effort, uh, as, uh, uh, major evidence showing um, uh, that she doesn't really take into account. And this happened when Eichmann is in Hungary in 1944. In 1944, it was clear to the Germans that they were losing the war. Uh, Hungary was the last place in which it was still a concentration of Jews. Eichmann goes to Hungary, organizes councils, and even though Himmler, the superior, is now ordering a de-emphasis on uh, the camps of anti said. Eichmann continues to send Jews to Auschwitz from March of 1944 to October. 400,000 Hungarians were sent to Auschwitz. Now, uh, uh, there have been many attempts to explain it, but that, that, that shows to me something more ideologically convinced about what he's doing than uh, merely being a kind of successful bureaucrat who wanted to get ahead with the peace. And that debate, although not as sharp as it is, it continues to go on. It continues to go on. Did Hannah Arendt get Eichmann right or wrong? I personally think that that's not, it's not an important issue, but it's not the main issue. My own opinion, as I've indicated, is I don't think she had the cold right. I think she was a bit wrong. Not that he was a vicious monster, but he was more complex. In fact, I sometimes think that the real banality of Eichmann, that he was like as I don't know if you know the Woody Allen movie, Selig, but it's a movie about a person who changes his identity in different situations, depending who he's with. And I think there was something like that in Eichmann, that when he was a Nazi officer, you act like a Nazi officer and you talk like one. When he was in Argentina, he boasted. He boasted about he could have said five million Jews, which is all false. And when you're in Jerusalem court, will you talk differently? I personally think that's a little banality. But the major point I want to make is this, is there is the accuracy of the historical interpretation but it's also the question about the validity of the Constitution. And here I do think that the Constitution is still an important concept for us today. And why is it important? Because it's a concept that you do not have to be a monster. You do not have to be a sadist to do terrible, terrible deeds. You could be a person who is, in all respects, look normal, but thrown into a situation that you can commit these horrendous acts. That I think is something that we're seeing in all the time in the world since already. My favorite example is uh, the American example of that when Abu Ghraib, the prison in Iraq, was revealed and you know, seeing the terrible things that were being done, blindfolded, torturing, you know, things was exposed. Uh, who, where was the anger? The anger was directed towards the immediate officers and the persons who really were making fun and made pictures of him and so forth. That's what became the focal point. Not to the American administration, the people like Lunsfeld and the Bush, who created a situation in which us come on So you could say they're good people, they only intend things, but they created a climate which these things can be the case. My claim is that the banality of evil is a concept. You know, let's leave out Eichmann. 
is still very important. Important to understand that normal people thrown into certain situations who don't take responsibility can do terrible, terrible things. Okay, um, I'm gonna take up just a little bit more time because I wanna talk about two more themes. Uh, one is the one. One theme I want to talk about is this is there in the earliest work all the way through that Arendt was deeply concerned with the issue of responsibility. Again, we're taking responsibility for the political world that she did. It's there in our earliest works, and even in origin, she's critical of the history of the Jewish people, because she felt that they did not take responsibility, join with oppositions and fight prejudice. They tried to just bury their heads and get along with anti-Semitism. The theme of irresponsibility is there in the, in the Eichmann book. Arendt thinks that, you, that all this talk about being a cog in a machine was really nonsense. And in fact, she says in the book, quote, Eichmann was one of the greatest criminals of the 20th century. And he was responsible for what he did. And did. There were, uh, even though they never proved that Eichmann physically murdered someone, and nevertheless, the role he played in sending about millions of people to their death is not something that he used should escape. And indeed, in the end, I told you that she wrote, well, I didn't tell you, I mentioned it now when she wrote it, that she ended Eichmann uh, uh, in Jerusalem with, with her own statement of why Eichmann deserved the death penalty because of responsibility. The final thing I really want to turn to now, because I've been talking mainly about the naked dark side is this the other side, the illumination. Uh, I'm sure that some of the papers in this conference will touch on it. But Arendt's deep, it's summed up for her in the word mentality, the, and particularly what you call second word. But Arendt deeply believed that as long as we are still human, I mean, and not subject to the kinds of things that the Nazis did in total domination, that human beings can spontaneously join together, grow in power, and start a new beginning. This is the phenomenon that Arendt saw in the American Revolution. For how the American Revolution is not what we call the American Revolution, what happened in 1776. It was what happened afterwards. The coming together of the people to write, to, to, to found a new republic. And I think what is remarkable about the story of the American Constitution, this is not something which was top down. Even though the draft was prepared in Philadelphia, Every state had to have a convention approving it. And it would be, it was, the Constitution was only accepted when at least nine of the 13 states agreed to it. Turned out the ninth state to agree to it was New York. But the idea of people coming together, citizens, and voting on whether they want this Constitution, that for her is a high point. Uh, and Arendt then goes on and speaks about the revolutionary spirit. I don't want to go into the story of what she thinks went wrong in America after that. But what she felt is that the phenomenon in very different places of seeing spontaneous people coming together and acting to create something new, not by leadership, but almost out of the kind of thing. She saw this phenomenon in the Paris Commune. She saw it in the early, early so Soviets, where the Soviets were still a people's thing before they were destroyed by Lenin. She saw it even in the early Rata in Germany, 
she saw it in the early civil rights movement. And one of her most euphoric descriptions of it was the 1956 uh, Hungarian rebellion, where against all odds, people came together, formed their own kind of councils. She was a great advocate of the council system and organized themselves to fight for everything. That is now what I, and maybe this is what I really want to do. Yes, brilliant insight, the darkest time, brilliant insights into the threats, but the message of hope in Arendt concerns natality and new beginnings. The possibility that people, and I think that we, we see now in various countries, they may be yet ineffective, where people come together to organize, to say, you know, as you put it in a beautiful place, we want to participate. We want to determine our fate. We, and she said in that same thing, the voting booth is too small. There's only room for one. The parties are corrupt. But if 10 people begin to get together in a room and begin to talk, then um, that could be the beginning of the growth of something. I mean, a rent, of course, did not live to uh, see the solidarity movement, movement in Poland. But I think the solidarity movement illustrates a rent united that here is um, dissonance sitting around the kitchen tables talking how it grew into a nonviolent movement. I mean, it's still, whatever we think of happiness since 1989, it's still impressive that the overthrow of communism happened in uh, of the communist countries happened as a result of a nonviolent movement. Poland and, uh, and in, in Prague, or Prague in, uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia, etc. That is impressive. And that is the phenomenon that Arendt wants to isolate. And I think today that although I believe this is the darkest time that I've ever been through in terms of what we see, not just the, I, throughout the world of the new forms of authoritarianism, the growth of the extreme right, the tremendous success of neoliberalism. Still, one can begin to see in different parts of the world, emerging groups who want to, to start something, new, want to challenge, really want to claim that we can win. And she, Arendt has a kind of beautiful statement at one point. With every birth, there is the possibility of a new beginning. And that new beginning thing she associates with me. So maybe I will leave it there. We can have our discussion. I'm happy to talk about anything that I did say or many of the things I didn't say. And I all wish you well for this conference. I'm sure that it will lead to, uh, I mean, my talk was intended to be introductory to give you a feel why what, you do, what you're doing here is important. I'm sure there'll be a lot more sophistication in uh, the papers that follow the conference. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dick. Adriano here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, thank you for your intervention. Uh, your interventions always combine clarity with powerful insights and critical judgments. And so I was missing. I will start the questions and our su suggestion is to group some of them, okay? For you? Uh, Any way you want to do it. As yeah. you probably remember, I'm uh -huh. not, as, as you probably remember, I'm not hesitant to talk. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you okay. do it the way you want, and I'll uh, try and do my best to uh, answer the questions. Okay, thank you. I'd like to start by asking you about a part, the part of your book that deals with the banality of evil. 
after me, if it's okay, Nadia will ask you two questions too. Uh, Arendt claims that with the expression banality of evil, she did not want to present a theory about evil in general, but to describe a factual situation. That she has not conceived a theory about evil in general seems clear to me. But what do you think of her claim that the banality of evil only describe, describes a factual situation? What do you think yeah. about this? All right, shall I answer this question now? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I take it I'm unmuted. <laughs> you can hear me, can't you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a, a nuanced opinion. I mean, uh, Arendt frequently tried to defend herself that she's simply giving a report of the trial. Um, I think that that's not quite accurate. She's making judgment to it. And to use a phrase like the banality of evil is not to describe, it's to judge what is actually taking place, okay? And you have to take responsibility for the defending the judgment. I think it can, as I try to suggest, I think it can be defended. But I think that the truth is that if we could go all the way back, to when she first speaks about evil in the origins. Remember in the origins, she deals with this in terms of the issue of total domination. And if, uh, just to rehearse it, I'll, I'll try to remind you that in total domination, she describes three stages. The killing of the juridical man, that means legal prohibitions, the killing of the moral person, and she, so when she talks about the mother who had, was asked which of the three, and then ultimately the killing of individuality and woman. And in the book, she calls that radical. Okay, some people say she changed the mind. I don't believe she ever gave up that view about evil. I think that the radical, the view of radical evil and the banality evil, if you understand them, are, are compatible. So what strikes me is that a rent particularly from the period, uh, it goes all the way back to the Second World, was returning to the issue over and over again. So I'm a bit skeptical about calling the validity of, uh, uh, of evil a theory, as if it's a thing with a theory which is systematic and you have consequences. I think it describes one strain in evil. And I think that Arendt would say that that even if I pressed her and I said, wait a minute, it's not just a description, it really is a judgment. I think she would say, yes, it is a judgment, but I think it's a judgment that I can give, I can justify as not understanding it all evil. After all, the banality of evil doesn't apply to Hitler. It doesn't apply to others. She wasn't calling them, she was calling Eichmann then. So I think Arendt herself is aware that it's not intended as a kind of comprehensive. Okay, thank you, Dick. Nadia. Okay, Dick, thank you so much for your talk. Could, could you get a little bit closer to the microphone so I can hear you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you uh, first for your talk. It's a, it's always a pleasure to to hear you. Well, I'd like to encourage uh, our group here at Zoom to raise hands or to make the questions in the chat, uh, both in Portuguese or English. We have two questions uh, from YouTube. Before I read them, uh, I would like to make uh, a question to you, uh, which is, in this book, you, you share with us some of Aaron's controversies, and I'd like to hear you about the reflections on Little Rock. It attracts me. How you read Aaron like in the tension? I mean, you don't obliterate her controversies or blind spots. Uh, you are keen to disagree with her, but in the same time, you do it in a very generous way, considering other sources of her thought to think the same problem. Uh, in this book, you've pointed out problems she brought to herself when she remained rigid, imposing distinctions she herself made. 
And here I'm talking about the distinction between the social and the political. Yeah. Uh, Although I think Arendt is really insightful when she develops this distinction to point out the loss of public freedom, uh, to restore the, the dignity of, po of politics, and to show the reduction of the public sphere in our times. I agree with you that she commits misjudgments when she imposes this distinction to any situation. So I have two questions about this. First, why was Arendt wrong? about her reflections on Little Rock and why did she fail to use the distinction to think about this problem? And Wait, also about- you repeat what, I didn't get what you said, just repeat what you said. Why was okay. she wrong about what? The, her reflections on Little Rock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did she fail to use this distinction to think about this problem? And about the same problem, the second question is, um, it also attracts me how you read Arendt from the margins to, to the center, to use Ben Habib's word. I mean, you argue we can have a narrow view of Arendt's politics if we remain reading, for example, the human condition without considering, for example, her readings uh, on the Jewish, uh, her writings on the Jewish question. We could right. say it is still marginal nowadays in face of her other words. So at this point, my question is, considering her reflection on the Jewish question, do you think we can find there some resource to read and think about the Negro question in Arendt? Yeah. Well, there were actually, you know, to me, your question involves a number of different issues. Let me try and speak to some of them. Um, look, I do think that the way in which she sometimes presented the distinction of the social and the political was really disastrous. Um, because there are passages that read as if this is a sharp categorical distinction. What is social is not political, what is political is not so social. And I think this simply will not work. Um, I thought this thing this came out beautifully at the 1972 conference when, when Mary McCarthy had asked, well, if you, in terms of this politics, when people are deliberating, what are they deliberating about? If they're not deliberating about the economy, about various other sorts of things. And I think that that's, I mean, I think the answer that Arendt gave at that point was very, very feeble. I do not think you can really social, separate the social from the political in a categorical way. And when she did, it seemed to me, you know, I mean, look, you can take the attitude, you can agree with her that the terrible poverty that existed in France um, and, and of the song Claude was a disaster for the French Revolution. You can agree with that. But that doesn't mean that poverty is not a serious political issue. You know, you take any kind of issue that you're talking about. That's why I think the most generous interpretation, but she didn't, then I was going to get to the Jewish writings, but she didn't develop it this carefully, is she could have said there's a social and a political dimension of many, many different issues, and that we need to be aware of that. Okay, look, suppose we are concerned now, the United States, with, let's take we have a kind of worry about inflation, about the economy. There are technical issues. What kinds of things would bring down inflation? You know, uh, that is not something, that's something where you need the help of economists. It's not, I mean, what is it that could be done to do this? But whether they should be done, that's a political issue. So that you might have said that, wait a minute, of course, yeah, or take what to me is the best example. The New Deal in America, or a very good example. I mean, <clears throat> given Roosevelt's views, if you really wanted to get the United States out of depression, you can't just do, do this by having the will to it. You've got to know something about how the economy works. What steps are to be taken to do that? That's technical. That's, that, so in that sense, you could say, there is a role for social expertise, knowing how to deal with issues. Thing, but you know, there's always going to be the political face about what you should do. But 
take an example that you gave. You know, it's fair housing for underprivileged people. It takes, it's a technical issue what this involves, but it's a political issue whether you want to take those steps and, and do it. I mean, I think that, you know, we have a crazy policy in this country. We don't really we have a real political will to solve in, uh, the problem of inequity. So I would want to say, I mean, if I, if Arendt were alive today and we were discussing this issue, these are the kinds of points that I would really want to make. Um, I am not sure. And now I do want to say something, I think, in our defense. Um, and this has to do with how to read Arendt. Uh, one of the favorite exchanges that she had with Carl Jospers, I've always loved this, in a very different context. Uh, Jospers was you know, very close and very fond of her and great dialogue on He wrote to her at one point. Arendt, you exaggerate. And she exploded. And what she basically said, exaggerate, exaggerate. How can you think without exaggerating? Okay, and then she also said, besides also look at the world, it's exaggerated. Now, I think what that reveals is this, is I do think that Arendt frequently overstates her distinction because she wanted us to come to see something that we tend to be blind. That she really wanted to come to see. I mean, look, <clears throat> if you would bring what Arendt has to say about public freedom and politics to any living politician today, in Brazil, or here, they would say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not what politics is. Politics is negotiation, probably is ruling over the people. The idea that it's deliberation and discussion, and that's not politics. You know, I think that it's <clears throat> what I think Arendt is frequently doing is, is exaggerating, is overstating our case and for a very specific purpose to get us to see what we are blind to see, what we don't see. He, and indeed, this, I think, becomes critical for our time. If you accept, you know, traditional common senses of politics, politics is who rules over whom, politics is who can get their way, politics is, you know, getting enough money to do what you want, want then uh, you're going to be blind to realize that there is another different tradition and that we could still restore this kind of tradition in modest or maybe uh, more ambitious ways in terms of taking seriously that uh, politics, which is, I think, ultimately, she would always use the word, is she like to use the word the republic, is does involve participation, does involve deliberation. And we can go all the way back to the Greeks and begin to see the origins of that. And that, in a way, the task is to try to restore this in our own time. So there's a point, it seems to me, to, if you're taking a hermeneutically generous or overstatements, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not sure what other aspects, I don't, I, what I think is interesting about some of the comments in the Jewish writings is the way in which he very frequently emphasizes the importance of identifying herself with the people. And that those are, so I think there are elements there that can be related to her other work, but I don't know if, it's, if they're sufficient to really sort of clarify the main issues that you're raising. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, not in now. We, we have questions from YouTube. Okay. Uh, I read. Uh, Professor Bernstein, are you familiar with the work of Sophie Lloyd Dolt? I know a little bit about the work, her work, uh, yes. 
Okay. My meta. Yeah. Okay. So arguments that are tries to create a phenomenological theory of politics. Yeah. In the, in the idea of levels of realized self connected with public appearance and public action. A fully realized self could be understood as the experience of the policy. The okay. more, yeah, the more you use it. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, one, two sentences more. Uh, the yeah. more you use it to action we are, the appearance of violence is uh, still possible and probable is lessened. Yeah. The more you uh, use it to action we are. Could you comment on this? this yeah, first let me question. first of all deal on the first part. Okay. Um, I know this is Sophia's work and I know okay. where she's coming from. Um, my only skepticism is this. I think Arendt was a creative thinker who appropriated what she felt was important from different types of traditions. I mean, there are things that she appropriates from Kant. There are people, the things that she appropriates from Aristotle. Um, and, uh, and certainly, we know that Heidegger was a major influence on her kind of thinking. But I'm a little bit uh, skeptical of, put, of using a label to characterize something. That she, she is, she's certainly not a fairly phenomenal artist, you know. Uh, maybe she's close to someone like Melo Ponty, who she greatly admired. So if you want to say that the phenomena, and particularly the form of phenomenology that it took with someone like Heidegger was tremendously influential on in thinking, in, uh, I certainly don't want to contest that. But what makes me uncomfortable is when you feel, ah, you have to put it to a category. And really she gains her insights from the the tradition of phenomenology and not from other places. I don't think that's that's it. I mean, you know, um, what I admire in a way is her ability to creatively appropriate, okay? Now, let's, let me give you another example to make my point that would also be relevant to phenomenology. Any serious consul who really knows the third critique, would say that many of the things that Oren has to say about there is where we find political, his Kant's political philosophy would say that's absurd. I mean, in other words, if you were a graduate student taking a course in the critique of judgment, that would never go over. But what's so interesting, so it clearly, She's reading some of her ideas, and everything. but clearly what's so fascinating is what she's able to do with it. She's able to develop a theory of judgment that does apply to politics. So the measure of a thinker is not how accurate or how, I mean, I think this is also true with Heidegger because my view of her and Heidegger is that she was in constant dialogue. She is as critical of Heidegger as she is. And I think that the way I would sum it up not everybody agrees with me, but I would say this. I think that our real beef with Heidegger is that he has no appreciation for what she calls plurality. And Mitta Zayn is not plurality. So, um, you know, it's what I think it does with something. What is great, that's what's more interesting. It's more interesting what, <clears throat> to me, to ask the question, what is she trying to do with Kant? rather than does she have conflict? Or what is she trying to do with Aristotle or with, um, or, or with Heidegger uh, in these things? Does she have Heidegger right? And I think that lots of Heideggerans could say, well, no, she doesn't have any Heidegger right. That's not interesting. That's kind of creative appropriation. And uh, you know, I think you have to be gifted and be maybe really a genius to do that well. You know, it, it's not to be judged by the criterion. Wait a minute. This does not completely correspond with the text of what Kant says, or what Aristotle says, or what Heidegger says. Right. 
So that would be uh, how I would answer the first part. Um, there was another part of your question. The question, you can you repeat it? That's the question about phenomenology and yeah. high and rent. Yeah. Yeah. Not just I thought I, I don't know if I completely answer the question. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, the, yeah there's another question from Sebastian, uh, which is considering Aaron's importance, particularly her understanding of human freedom. What can you say about freedom and choice in times of pandemics? In times of what? Of pandemics. Well, I think, I mean, uh, that's a complicated question. But what I do think is this, is that, let's, let's talk about this. Maybe it's also true in Brazil. Talk about it in our country. If we were fed so much misinformation by the Trump administration when it, when it began, lies. Now, in terms of groups, not just individuals, but groups, in a certain, trying to counter this, you know, that I think is was tremendously important. And I suspect that the same type of thing exists in Brazil. You have a government, which I think, I don't know if he outdoes Trump in terms of lies and misinformation and myths and so forth. It's important that there be individuals and groups, you know, who say, no, this is not what is the case. Remember that uh, one of our great essays, in my opinion, is Truth and Politics. And there Arendt makes the point that even though politics is a matter of opinion, truth, factual truth is absolutely important. You destroy factual truth and you can destroy politics itself. Truth has to inform politics. It doesn't determine politics itself. I mean, again, for those who haven't read that essay recently, I think you should read it because I think that, that essay could have been written yesterday. The grasp that Arendt has, that the real danger is that the very distinction between truth and falsehood that is being undermined is a real danger, and it's certainly a danger that I'm seeing, in, or certainly a danger that I was seeing in my country with the Trump administration. You know, you know. Remember, she makes a distinction between two types of liars. There's a liar who knows the truth and tries to lie about it. A liar who knows that a donkey is not a mule, but tries to convince you that it's a mule, okay? That's a person who could still distinguish truth from falsity. And then there's the kind of liar who doesn't see the difference. My own hypothesis between, I don't want to speak about others, but about Trump, I think he frequently doesn't see that there is any difference between, uh, you know, that he doesn't really see a distinction that something is true who, um, and that I'm going to lie about it. I don't think that's what Trump does. I think what Trump did is he doesn't have any understanding. He thinks that what people call the truth is only there for political reason. So the idea that a very serious threat to a thing is destroy the distinction between truth and, and uh, false is something which I think we are seeing in our times, or at least the attempt to do. Yes, thank you, Professor Bernstein. Well, I think we don't have any other questions, not even in YouTube and here in Zoom. So I would like to ask you for final considerations. I think we are going to- uh, can, I, can I make a okay. question, sorry? Yeah, sure, sure, Thiago. Okay, go ahead. I'm happy to take any thank questions you. from the audience, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was really interesting. So one thing that uh, struck me maybe is when you were talking about Eichmann and uh, you said on the one hand, there was this not necessarily in relation to Eichmann, but more in general, 
uh, in that uh, time period, there was on the one hand this, this element of uh, sadism, right? So so cruelty, yeah. like a kind of a pleasure, pleasure in in being cruel. So on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, there's all there was also banality or thoughtlessness, yeah. right? And whenever I, I go back to the oranges, these two elements speak to me as a way of trying to understand Trump in the US, but also Bolsonaro in Brazil. So uh, I'm just curious to know if you see these, these two elements as maybe like, I don't know, like political experiences of sorts that could help us understand this kind of uh, figures as, like I said, Trump and, and, uh, and Bolsonaro. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, the question is also, even if Trump and Bolsonaro haven't like implemented, uh, implemented a totalitarian regime yeah. in both countries, the risk is, is still there because you can see these two elements at play. So on the one hand, sadism, and on the other hand, Thoughtlessness. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I, I want to be a little bit hesitant about <laughs> presenting myself as an authority on Brazilian um, uh, politics, although it's hard when I read about what's going on in Brazil not to see the kinds of parallels that are, are going on. I, you know, I was one way of making my point as sharp as possible is this. I think when people are confronted with terrible things that they want to call evil, they're drawn to think in categories of black and white. This is good and this is evil. That's there, there is, in fact, people feel if you don't give them that, and I think this is certainly certainly true. This is in the United States that at times of crisis that people want to think that's the way the world is. The good guys and the bad, the victims and the perpetuators. I think one of the effective way of making a Ren's point is that is a misleading dichotomy. And that the perpetuation of evil, is, it is not the case that evil people are monsters in the sense that they're sadist or anti this or that it's, they're ideologically mo motivated in this. They, it can be that whatever their motives, they're doing terrible things. People, I think, don't want to hear that. Certainly, this was the case of the Eichmann trial, where people were thought that she's exonerating Eichmann if you don't call him a monster. And I don't think that she, I think she was saying, you want to understand the Eichmanns of the world, then you have to use more subtle categories to understand. So that's the making the point negatively makes it very sharp, it makes it very sharp that binary opposition, you know, sometimes it appears in literature. I think she felt it was there in the Melville story, Bill, Billy Budd, um, where you have the innocent, but even though he is charged with a crime, but it's not something that I think happens in the real world. Anyway, I mean, that's not a deny that there are real sadists, there are real monsters, there are real people who get sheer pleasure out of torturing people when they crop up in any kind of terrible life. Nobody wants to deny that, but to try to understand, you know, that if that is the key to understanding evil, I think it's just a serious mistake. Yeah. You don't have to be a sadist or an ideologue to commit uh, all kinds of horrendous acts. And that's not something that I think people want to hear. They don't want to hear that, you know, I mean, that it could have been me in that kind of situation. No, not me, because I'm not sadistic. I'm not e ideologically motive, but it could have been if you were in Eichmann's position of some of the things that he did when he was uh, uh, head of the Jewish affairs. So that's, that's, 
I, I don't know if this helps, but that's the way in which I would try and sharpen the issue so about this. And that then, you know, the other thing, I, I didn't mention this before, but I want to mention it uh, uh, now explicitly. We can't read or rent for solutions to our problems. You know, even if you did a kind of Google search, you would discover that one of our favorite words is perplexities. Perplexities. I think what you want to do is make us aware of the perplexities that you have to think about if you're going to try and think about real issues. And in her beautiful essay on thinking and moral considerations, she talks about Socrates as a kind of paradigm here. And she makes a beautiful point, which I think is true. I find it true as an, even as a teacher. How do you get people to think? Not by telling them, not by just giving them a book to read, but trying to infect them with the perplexities that you feel. That's what she felt that Socrates, and that's what I think that she was trying to do. So you look at whether we're talking about the right to have rights, we're talking about evil and so forth. I, you want to, you have to, if you're going to stop and think real Dinkin in herself, then in a way you have to be infected by those kinds of perplexities. You know, some people are successful in doing it, some people are not. But I, I think the example of Socrates that he's trying to infect people with the perplexities that he's faced, I think was a brilliant observation. Okay, I think Thiago has one more comment about it, right, Thiago? Right, right. Yeah, no, I just um, to, to make my, 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 my uh, point of view a little bit clearer. Uh, yeah, I, I, I totally uh, agree with you. Uh, it seems to me like is this like combination of at least like when I'm trying to understand Bolsonaro in Brazil, this combination of a minority or of few people who are probably or or possibly sadistic, and I mean like Bolsonaro himself. Yeah. Uh, but then a majority of people who are thoughtless, and and because they are thoughtless, then they 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 follow person like Bolsonaro or, or Trump in the US. So, and this, and this uh, combination can be quite uh, explosive and, 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 and consequential. Yeah, so that's, that's what's, uh, what I was trying to do. You know, I not only do, uh, I, do I, was, I totally agree with you. And I also want to say that this is a problem. I mean, that, I mean, I can put it in general terms, it's a problem that Oren was facing all in her life. I mean, for example, take the way in which people talk about the, the, the Holocaust. There are the perpetuators, there are the victims, and there are the bystanders, okay? Now, bystanders are not innocent. We know enough about the history of Germany to know that at least you know, in the early days of the rise of Hitler, if more people didn't think he was just a clown or that this would pass, stood up and protested that they could have been affected. In other words, this is a kind of more general point of Arendt. There is no, I mean, you know, we know, you know the theme in Arendt, she radically objects to the whole idea of historical necessity. There is always a possibility about this and that the trouble is about those who want to go along or those who don't act or those who are seduced by other things, et cetera. So that's a, a phenomenon that I think that Arendt was deeply concerned with in this. In fact, this is, uh, I think this goes all the way back to the Jewish writing, writings that you can't say, well, it's going to go away. It isn't so bad, or I don't have to be concerned about it, or it will pass. If you continue to think that way, it can be a disaster. You know? And that she then thinks that many people do who are taken to be innocent because they, they were not the, the killers. They're not, they are bare responsibility for what they've done. And I think this is true. Not only in, in those situations, she's described, it's true today. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were all more complex things. I just have read a, actually a fantastic book, which I would recommend to everybody, on by Wendy Brown, who is a political theorist in the United States. It's the best book I have ever read on neoliberalism. I mean, really analyzing it and realizing it's historical, the sources. And here, you can see it's not just people not being responsible, but the kinds of neoliberal techniques to undermine any kind of will for change and to destroy, which he calls the uh, democracy itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here really to advertise other books, but I read this book. I mean, I felt there's been a lot of loose talk about neo neoliberalism, but here is a fantastic, it's called The Runes, I think, of Neoliberalism, and it's a brilliant book. Uh, thing which I would recommend to anybody who wants to understand neoliberalism and understand something of the problem that you're talking about is how do these people, oh, how come, what is it that they're doing that makes them so successful? Oh, various kinds of authority. Okay. And which she recovers again the distinction between the social and the political, criticizing Aaron in this book, Randy Brown, in this reigns of neoliberalism yeah. uh, ag again the question come up, comes up <laughs> yes uh well yeah i'd like to know if uh, anybody else can, uh, want wants to make questions okay so uh, professor uh i would like to deeply thank you for you thank me i want to make a comment yeah yeah i, I, I would tell oh. you to to make the, the final comment oh, okay sure. okay yeah yeah, I can thank you just in, in the end. So, so you feel now, free the to- The comment I want to make is this. Uh, what I, I mean, as you have nicely brought out that in all of my writings, I'm both appreciative and I try to be, uh, but, but when I think she's wrong, I mean, I really do have the feeling and when Arendt was wrong, she was just terribly wrong. I mean, she would, could, could be. And we have to say that, you know, uh, it, it, it's a bad thing, right? But what uh, impresses me, and I think will be illustrated in your con conference, is the sheer fecundity and fertility of her thinking. That uh, I'm always, and I think that you probably too, who, I mean, ah, uh, it's, I've been looking now at concern with Arendt for 50 years. I'm always discovering new things. And I'm also discovering new scholars who come along and really see aspects that um, I didn't really see that are there. I mean, a great thinker, a classic thinker, a thinker, I mean, Gallimard originally said this, is a classic thinker is one who's always raising new questions, not just about them, that are relevant to us today. So I'm sure that a lot of this will come out of your comments, okay? And I've been sort of excited myself over the years. I mean, now, I mean, after all, unfortunately, it's become almost an overworked industry. But in each generation, I see uh, new insights, new ways of thinking about a rent, rent. I'm learning when I teach courses and I run for my students. You know, I think, I, let me just say the last thing because I think this probably applies in Brazil itself. I don't know how many courses I've taught on the rent over the years, but many. And what I discover is very frequently, I mean, there are some people, I can't read her, she doesn't make sense, she's not systematic, you know, she doesn't define her terms, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's standard. But I'm really, fascinated by the number of people who get excited. And I think there's a reason. I would say this in America, I don't know this about a reason. What students hunger for is a person who they, their image of a real intellectual. And what is the image of a real intellectual? Someone who's not just a scholar or a specialist, but somebody who takes ideas seriously and is able to make them relevant to problems that we're all worried about. 
problems of statelessness, problems of that. Or what has got that capacity? In other words, she's a paradigm, meaning whether you're for or against them, of the type of intellectual uh, that uh, has that ability he, to talk about Heidegger and Kant and Aristotle and St. Thomas, but nevertheless, always trying to make it relevant to what's going on in the present. That's a great talent, you know, uh, uh, and one that's worth trying to emulate uh, if you have uh, the ability to. And I think that that's why it, it, that she speaks to people because that's what they think that we, we should be doing, not writing treat, further treatises on Kantian ethics <laughs> or on the Inquisitors of Aristotle. Not that she's against that, but people who use ideas, think about ideas to talk about issues that are really vital and important for us. And currently had that and has it today. That's one of the reasons I think that there's so much interest in Arendt because she speaks to us, you know, as a thinker who's got something to say about our problems and our difficulties. Okay, I leave you with that thought. You will carry it out in your discussions. Okay, but I, I really would like to stress that we can spend a whole night hearing you. It's always a pleasure. I am concerned about your time, but we are not really concerned about it. Well, yeah. I, I think that might be appropriate to end soon. Although, as you know, from your direct experience, once I get start talking, it's hard to stop me. I frequently find that when I'm teaching a seminar or something, the students, after two hours, they've had enough. And I'm still going strong. <laughs> but I think maybe, we, I think I basically have said what I wanted to say today, and I wish you good luck in the coming days of your, uh, of your uh, uh, studies, yeah. Thank and you. I also make this point, okay. while I'm still Please. healthy and, uh, and you know, I'm getting to be uh, up there, you know, I'm going to be 90 this, uh, uh, this May, but if any of you are in New York, you know, besides the people I know, and would like to have an account, or if you want to email me, or you want to have a chat with me, do not hesitate. I'm open to discussion, and, and I make this offer. Anybody who's participating in this conference who comes to New York and wants to talk to me about a rent, I will buy them lunch, okay? <laughs> Well, and I would like to stress this too, uh, and thank personally thank you uh, how Professor Burson is always really, really kind and helpful. And uh, I really want to thank you for this, that we are always learning with you directly or indirectly. And, and for, for all, the, all, all of these in the last two years that I, I could have the, the opportunity to learn with you and also to bring bring you like virtually to this meeting, which is really important. And we have a, 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 a much uh, feeling for this, this group too. And I really want to thank you. And also I want to thank you to teachers, how to read errant, to learn with errant in this tension, with errant against errant. I think it's much more alive and productive when we do it. Big philosophers, big contradictions. So we need to face them. And I really want to thank you. I think Adriano wants to say something to you. No, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dick, again. And uh, also for your, uh, when I stayed in New York, uh, it was amazing. And thank you again for this and for your conference today. I may be Thanks. getting chronically older, but I haven't lost my passion <laughs> for <laughs> discussion or for a rent. Okay. Okay. Be well and good luck with the rest of the conference. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say to you also buy the book Por que Le Hannah Arendt? Hoje, here in Brazil, the translation is available. Uh, I'm going to say, as Richard, as, uh, as Richard said to the students, I could attend to his class, to undergraduate classes at New School. And after uh, along the class, he said, 
your parents need to read this book. Did you buy this book to, to your parents? Uh, I, I think I want to just stress it. Everybody needs to do, read this book. That's the feeling. So read this book and buy to your parents and your colleagues and to your children too, okay? And your friends or anybody you know who says, I've heard the word of rent, but I want to find out more about it. Yeah, sure. I'm yeah. not so much interested in selling books, but I am interested in, in getting people to, to read on a, a rent now. Yeah, and that was that was the feeling that like engaged us translating it uh, when we were when I was reading this book in 1918. Uh, when I finished this book, I was just like with kind of my heart was uh, uh, crashing because I was really anxiety with this because it's really insightful. And then the feeling is everybody needs to read this book. So that's the feeling that we wanted to bring. Uh, the, the translation to Brazil and also Dick to this meeting. So that's why we're really happy uh, with this night and really happy uh, to with your talk, Dick. And thank you. I hope the book does well in Brazil. Okay. So give it to your parents and friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. See you. Okay. Okay. I look forward to meeting some of you in New York. Yeah, we're looking okay. forward to. Bye bye. Bye-bye.